join this uh, LIBA Citizen Science Working Group uh, webinar. My name is uh, Paul Ayres, I'm Prairie Wise Provost in UCL, University College London, and I have a range of uh, responsibilities as part of that role. Uh, and one of them is uh, creating and uh, developing the Office for Open Science. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, today um highlighting how citizen science has to fit into the general approach of the office in delivering open science solutions to my uh, colleagues across ucl uh, ne next slide please so these are the the eight pillars of open science as we commonly uh, define them in uh, europe they're recognized as the pillars by uh, the European Commission. And you'll see there uh, in number eight, uh, well, not in any particular order, but uh, the way they're, they're normally quoted at the bottom of the screen, citizen science as one of the pillars of uh, the open science program that the commission and European funders are wanting to put into uh, place. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, how does um, uh, the um, Office for Open Science deal with all these different areas? And how does um, the office stimulate uh, activity across all eight pillars? Uh, I see someone in, in the chat has written, sadly, citizen science is often thought of as a last uh, resort. Um, I don't mean to give the impression that it is uh, uh, the last resort. Rather, I think what universities do is to look at their current activity and their future activity and prioritize accordingly. And in many of these areas, uh, many of these eight pillars, the future of scholarly publishing, um, open and fair data, uh, research integrity. The university um, has um, already um, considerable um, activity in, in these areas. So that's where they, a, a university would typically tend to start. And then they would move on to areas which are completely new. Uh, and here at the bottom of the uh, screen, uh, in, in, in the red boxes here, um, when we're looking at open science pillars, we see citizen science and next generation metrics, um, implications of DORA and the San Francisco Declaration, which are completely new in, in a university agenda. They would tend to be second, not because they're, they're less important, but you start with what you know, and then you move on to what you, you don't know. So here in UCL, we have an office for... Uh, open science and I'm currently uh, uh, the head of it. Uh, and what the office does across all these eight pillars of uh, open science is to offer these three um, qualities. Someone needs to lead, someone needs to advocate for open science, and there needs to be engagement with UCL staff and students. So all the solutions are co-produced and it is a community uh, activity. So that's what the office does. It, do, it doesn't do all the work itself as I'll come on to explain. Um, the work is parceled out across the whole university in a number of groupings, not all of which are directly part of the science office, but all of which are, are, are associated with the office in one form or another. So the, the Office for Open Science sits at the top as an umbrella organization which brings together all the activity in open science that's being practiced uh, across, uh, across the university. Uh, next um, slide, please. Tatiana. 
Okay, so here we do have uh, an explanation uh, in diagrammatic form of how the office uh, works. Uh, the colour coding is quite important, so let me go through the colour coding. So in the dark yellow uh, rectangles, you will see those eight pillars of um, open science, future of scholarly communication, in other words, what does publishing look like uh, going forward, EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud, their data, all those eight pillars in um, dark yellow um, rectangles on the screen. Then underneath each of those pillars, <clears throat> I've allocated a team which is responsible for um, taking that work forward across uh, the university. Now, many of these teams, especially the bigger teams, are in are in the off are in the library, um, UCL Library Services, which is also responsible for the Office for Open Science. So here on on the left hand side of the screen, the future of scholarly communication, the future of scholarly publishing. Th uh, there are two teams that are involved there. There's the open access team in uh, the library which looks at funder requirements and funder compliance with funder mandates for open access payments. Uh, and also UCL Press, which is the UK's first fully open access university uh, press. So all those boxes in, in cream or light yellow are all based uh, in the library and they're, and they're run by the library. Towards the right of the screen, in these other um, um, areas, pillars of open science, you'll see the boxes at the bottom of the screen are, are in different colours. And, and that's because it's an activity which isn't a library activity, but is naturally falling to another part of the university. So, for example, under research integrity, um, it's the research office in the vice provost's um, office, which is responsible for research integrity. So in terms of uh, issues like reproducibility and uh, transparency and the UK Re Reproducibility Network, it would be the research office that deals with that. And I would, they would be associate members of the Open Science Office to make sure that what they're saying and the work they're doing is coordinated with uh, the Open Science message that the office as a whole is trying to put across the whole of UCL. So how do we deal with citizen science? Well, here we have citizen science on the right-hand side of the screen. And, and then we have yet another arrangement for citizen science because citizen science is prevalent across the whole of the university. Many academic departments um, engage in citizen science and report on the impact that their citizen science work has in uh, research assessment. So some of the impact case studies that academic departments have submitted to our national research evaluation framework uh, last year will be citizen science impact case studies to show the impact that the research that a UCL academic is doing, what impact that has on society and challenges that face society uh, as a whole. So how do you coordinate citizen science activity in that sense across the university when we've let a thousand flowers bloom and every department has the ability to do that for themselves? So the way we've done it through the office is to have a citizen science working group uh, a steering group rather. So the citizen science steering group is there to coordinate and join up all the individual bits of work that are happening in academic departments and to advocate for citizen science principles and practice. Do you remember those three values that I highlighted in the previous slide? Leadership, advocacy, and engagement. That's what we do with citizen science and it's exercise through the citizen science steering group. So what kinds of things can we do at university level when so many 
departments are doing their own citizen science outreach. Well, one of the things we've been asked to do is to devise a kite mark for citizen scientists who come to us from the London boroughs and want to work with uh, UCL. They're lay citizens, often uh, school children, often uh, retired people who want to do something with their retirement. They work with uh, the academic departments uh, around citizen science activity, but then want some recognition for what they've done, not necessarily payment. There's not a payment. What we're devising is a certificate or accreditation it shows that these individuals have been through a training scheme, which UCL has approved. Uh, and so they're trained to, the, to a basic level in citizen science and research activity. Now that certification means much more to them than getting payment for um, working with um, UCL researchers. So it's that kind of umbrella activity that the citizen science Office is uh, enabled to uh, deliver to complement what is happening at a departmental level, not to replace it, but to work alongside the departments to complement their individual activities. Uh, next slide, please, um, Luciana. So, what does this look like in uh, staff numbers? Well, you see here, I've tried to list how many staff are in or associated with uh, uh, the office. And of course it varies from, from team to team. The biggest team, as I said earlier, is the team around publishing. So our open access team and UCL Press for our institutional open access university uh, uh, press. And there we have about 20 people, at least 20 people uh, who are dedicated to delivering open access solutions, uh, which are being uh, required by all the uh, major UCL research funders that the UK has um, access to. Uh, you'll see that in the numbers in other areas are, are much smaller because these are teams that are only now being, being built up. So research, research integrity, for example, we have three people involved in uh, research integrity in the Vice Provost Researcher's Office, and they will soon transfer to the Office for Open Science, and we'll run uh, research integrity as an activity, one of those eight pillars uh, of open science, we'll run that as an activity from uh, the office itself. Uh, next slide, uh, please. How, do, how does the office work? How, do, uh, how, how are things governed? So here in the, in the third uh, slide, in, in the third um, uh, line here uh, uh, of the uh, table, I've talked about uh, governance. And we have two pan UCL committees for governance. E each open science pillar has its own committee or steering group, and as I said, Citizen Science has its own uh, steering group, which uh, meets termly. Uh, and uh, together, they um, contribute to a, a, a report that I make three times a year to our parent committee in UCL, which oversees open science activity. So three times a year, I have to uh, appear before the UCL committee Open Science, which is chaired by our Vice Provost Research, and I will look at all those eight areas of um, open science activity, uh, including citizen science, uh, and report on uh, what we've done. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and here is a list of actual open science um, activity that we've undertaken in each of those eight pillars. I want to concentrate particularly on uh, citizen, citizen science. So the, the office holds regular webinars across the university, rather like, rather like this one. Um, we, we had a very successful series of um, webinars in uh, September for um, a week of open science uh, activity and had 
just over a thousand attenders, not just from UCL, but from across the globe, from about 80 countries. And citizen science was one of the areas that we highlighted in uh, the webinars as an area where universities could make uh, uh, a difference. One of the major uh, citizen science activities that we have managed to develop, and it's a library run um, uh, uh, activity, is uh, Transcribe Bentham. Now, Jeremy Bentham is the 19th century utilitarian uh, philosopher, and he's the man who actually invented the um, adjective uh, international. We have most of his writings in UCL, in the library, in special collections as manuscript, notebooks, and letters, and archival material. Uh, and what we have done is to um, digitize them all with external funding, and then uh, start working towards a published edition of his writings based around UCL Press. So UCL Press will be the publisher. When you're creating this sort of edited uh, content, what normally would happen uh, is that you appoint one or two editors to work full time on the archive to do the transcription and then to uh, develop uh, proofs for a publication as the output of a um, complete published uh, edition. Uh, using citizen science approaches, uh, the library decided we wouldn't do it like that. We'd do it a different way. So what we have done is to crowdsource the transcripts, which means that we've opened up transcription to any uh, member of um, any lay member in the UK or outside the UK with an interest in Bentham who wants to um, contribute the published works. When they volunteer, uh, what we do is to uh, train them in paleography. Um, he writes in English, but his handwriting isn't too easy to read. And as he got older, it got worse uh, because he thought only I am going to read these notes, so I won't be very neat. So the later writings are more difficult than the than the earlier writings. But once we've trained um, the um, individuals uh, who volunteer, they're then let loose on the boxes of archival material. And we have a Benthamometer uh, on the Bentham project, the Transcribe Bentham website, which shows how many boxes have been transcribed uh, in, in this way. We must have transcribed over a thousand uh, pieces of material from uh, the Bentham corpus by using crowdsourced transcription in a citizen science uh, uh, landscape. When the transcripts come back, they're checked by uh, one of the editorial team who is not doing the original uh, transcription, but is just checking the transcription against the original for any obvious errors. And we found to our surprise, but pleasure, that the accuracy of the crowdsource uh, transcriptions is very high indeed, uh, and needs relatively little editing to form part of the printed uh, volume, which is then part of the uh, output uh, of the project. So this work is ongoing, and as a result of using citizen science um, um, activity, we've been able to shorten the amount of time needed to produce uh, his printed works. Uh, so the complete printed edition, if we were to use a um, professional editor or series of editors to do the transcription, we, we estimated it would take 20 years to finish the, uh, to finish the collected works of Bentham. Using transcription and crowdsourcing, we've got that down to 10 years. So we've halved the amount of time it's going to take to produce uh, the final printed uh, volumes of uh, the collected works. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
That's the other. So this is my uh, final slide. What we're trying to do in UCL is to see citizen science as a key activity and to embed it in open science activity uh, across, um, across the university. That means that we've tackled well-established areas of activity first, like publishing. Uh, and then we moved on to uh, new areas like the European Open Science Cloud and citizen science. We set up governance structures which coordinate all the activity as far as we can across uh, the university uh, to make sure that the UCL message and contribution on citizen science or next generation metrics is aligned with the university's policy position, which is strongly in favor of open science uh, activities. If you want to read a little bit more about how the UCL model was developed and why we chose the approaches that we did, uh, please feel free to look at these four um, uh, papers. Well, the first three papers uh, are the only ones that are publicly available. Th these are papers that I chaired the writing committee for. These are from LERU, the League of European Research Universities, where 23 research intensive universities across Europe came together to decide what they wanted to do about open access, what they wanted to do about research data. And then we looked at all eight pillars of open science, including, of course, citizen science, and decided what the next step should be for universities taking the initial step in this area. So if you have been, thank you very much for listening. And I'd be very happy to answer any questions or comments that um, you may have. Uh, I'm looking at the slide, I'm looking at the comments in the chat. I, I don't see any comments at the moment, but if you have got a comment, please do put it in the chat or put your hand up and, and Tatiana can let you in, I think, to speak. Yes, that's correct. So anyone, got, especially if you disagree with what I said about um, the way we've organized it in, uh, in uh, UCL, it is very centralized. Um, it is meant to be centralized. That's not to stop individual expertise um, from uh, delivering their own solutions, but it's meant to provide the glue that sticks everything together. Now, I do see someone uh, Sueli Brodin, I hope I have that right. Um, your hand is up. Uh, Tatiana, could you let uh, our yes, guest yes. to ask a question? You can just unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Paul, uh, for your presentation. I am Sueli. I work at Maastricht University and I am a member of the uh, Maastricht platform for community engaged research. And um, the, in the definition or the way uh, you presented uh, citizen science uh, in your university, in, within the platform, we see citizen science as something uh, being much broader uh, and involving actually citizens in the design of research yeah. projects. Uh, so, so really as, as full, fully participating in the, in yeah. the research process. So not, um, not as coming in at the end to provide help, but yeah. as being totally engaged from the start within the research thinking. And, and the idea by doing so is that the, the impact of the research will be much more important and much more relevant and sustainable uh, long-term uh, for uh, society. Yeah, no, that's really helpful a uh, point, uh, Sueli. So, thanks for mentioning it. Yes, I mean uh, the same is true in, in in UCL. The example I gave was of um, a lay citizen being a, a transcriber or working on archival uh, material. That's an example I gave because I'm a librarian and I'm rather pleased we made such a big entry into citizen science from the library. Uh, with my colleague, uh, Professor Mookie Hackley from the Department of Geography, who is our star citizen scientist in UCL, we have, a, we have an approach called extreme citizen science. 
Now, in extreme citizen science, that model is exactly the one you just outlined. The researcher is not simply collecting data or working under a professional researcher. They are trained to be um, researchers in their own right, to lead research projects, to understand um, the research strategy of the university and to contribute in, in a meaningful way, not as a partner, but as a leader. So it's a gradation, as you say, of different approaches to citizen science. I, I thank you very much for, for pointing that out. Okay, so there are some questions in the chat now. Um, so one of the questions is, could you outline what tasks library staff work with within uh, citizen science and which competence is important for the future? Oh, that's from Thomas in, uh, in uh, southern Denmark. Okay, so what tasks do the library staff work on? Well, most, um, it, one of those big teams would be representative of, of what library staff uh, are doing, and that would be the open access team. Now, in, in the UK, we have very strict funder requirements for open access publication, and our main funder, UK Research and Innovation, actually pays money for open access publication. So that team of, of, of 10 people work alongside uh, the researcher to enable them to publish where they want and to meet all the requirements that their research funder has. Uh, that might sound easy. It's not easy if you're a member of staff and you're uh, academic staff and you're teaching uh, and you've got project work and you've got to write your lectures and then you've got to submit your research outputs as well. You want it just to work. You want it just to be straightforward. You submit and it's accepted. But many publishers don't um, are not that transparent. And so um, meeting funder requirements from your research funder is a big part of the role of the library going forward. And 10 years ago, that team wouldn't have existed, but now it's one of the most important things that we, that we do. And as for competencies, I think the most important competence that I look for, for anyone who I want to come in and bring into the open science activity that we are operating is flexibility and a willingness to embrace change. That sounds easy, but universities often are not very keen on change. Change is a dirty word. Uh, and that's the last thing you do. But if you're going to embed open science principles and practice, citizen science, open access publishing, next generation metrics, you, you, you've got to have a nimble mind and be, be willing to throw out old um, um, ideas and bring in new ones and be able to transmit those to colleagues, to staff and students across UCL. So that's why the three qualities that the Open Science Office is working on are just those, leadership, engagement, and advocacy. Those are the three things that any open scientist who works for me in the library needs to be able to offer or demonstrate in order to get a role in, in the open science team. Otherwise, it's, it's just not going to work. Okay, I, I think I've done my 30 minutes, Tatiana. I could go on because there are more questions, but I bet the hand over to Anne now. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share my ideas. Thank you very much, Paul. I think we can give the floor to Anne Catherine, and then perhaps if we have more uh, more time at the end for both of you to answer questions, we can sure. approach yeah, happy. this way. Happy to do that, yeah. All right, thank you so much. And Catherine, the floor is yours. Let me share your presentation. There you go. Thank you, Tanya. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Anne Katrine. And uh, I will, in the next 20 minutes, touch upon our journey from a big idea to a network and further to a citizen science center at uh, SDU. Next, please. I'm not from the, the library. I'm from the Faculty of Health Sciences at SDU. 
but uh, I have been working with uh, Thomas uh, Castell from the SDU library for more than five years. And uh, our mission has been to establish citizen science at SDU. My perspective in this talk will be from uh, the faculty point of view. Next, please. It all started in uh, 2016. Thomas and I had been discussing ideas or a model for better interaction between citizens and researchers for some time. And uh, after a very positive meeting with one of the directors of the local university hospital, who, who liked the idea of engaging citizens in research, we, we decided to run our first citizen science workshop at SDU to get some concrete ideas for a citizen science project. Next, please. We invited about 30 guests to the workshop. The guests were a mix of uh, researchers from different faculties and from the hospital. And we also invited people from media, from museums, and of course, uh, citizens. We spent three hours together on a Saturday afternoon. And after a lot of talk and discussions and group work and presentations in plenum, we suddenly came up with the one concrete idea, which all thought were a splendid idea. The idea came from a professor from the university hospital, and um, it was a simple but uh, never done before idea. Citizen, citizens should be presented to five research projects related to health, and then it was up to the citizens to prioritize and decide which project, project that should be funded with 1 million Danish kroner. The director from the university hospital said that he could find the money if the media, a local TV broadcaster, was in as a media partner. And then it took off. Next, please. Next spring, the project was uh, in the air in a two week campaign, and it was a success from the start. In 2019, it grows from just covering Fune, the island in the middle of Denmark, to the whole region of southern Denmark with 1.2 million citizens. And it was covered by two local TV broadcasters. But then COVID-19 came along. And uh, yeah, it said, yeah, it was a stop. But the Citizen Science Project will be back again in spring 2022. Next, please. Our citizen science network grew out of this first citizen science project, which quickly were followed by more workshops and more citizen science project covering humanities, electronic waste, biology, active living, and many more. The network was a dynamic partnership changing from project to project, but always with the library faculty collaboration bridging researchers with people and organization outside the university. Next, please. Citizen science can be understood in different ways. So what does it mean to us at SDU? Next, please. In, the, in Denmark, citizen science is often used for data collection and mapping of wildlife. But at SDU, we see citizen science as more than that. We see citizen science as a method for interaction and dialogue between citizens and researchers, thereby reducing the distance between them uh, to enhance debate um, based on knowledge and fact instead of fake news and personal opinions. Next. Thomas and I use two models to explain our take on citizen science. Uh, this one is by Golombic. And this model shows three fundamental in the elements in citizen science, inclusion, contribution, and reciprocality. Inclusion and contribution are of course very important, but we believe that it is in reciprocality you can strike gold because it is in dialogue that both citizens and researchers can gain new insights and knowledge. Next. The other model is by Muki Hagley from UCL, as Paul just mentioned. And this model shows different level levels 
of uh, participation moving from citizens as sensors uh, to extreme citizen science, which is understood as a true and equal collaboration between citizens and researchers on a project. It should be said that for us, no level is better than the other. It all depends on the project and the researchers. So our citizen science project don't just fit one concept. It depends on the specific project, but we always try to have a focus on interaction, dialogue, and feedback. Next, please. Thomas and I began our citizen science journey with the, this uh, citizen science network. But in the beginning of this year, the network was transformed into a citizen science knowledge center with a steering committee consisting of deans and department chairs from the five faculties at the university, the head of the university library, and our pro rector. The knowledge center is based in our library. As I mentioned earlier, I'm from one of the faculties and, and at a faculty, we know about research and education, but for citizen science, we need additional professional competence and skills. And for us, our research library is an ideal partner for citizen science. Our knowledge center is run by a few seed money from the faculties and the library. And the library plays an important role as a facilitator and a bridge between citizens and research, as well as a collaborator for the researchers in, the, in specific projects. Next, please. And we do believe in the power of many. And the Citizen Science Center is still a partnership between the library and the faculties seen here in the, in the middle, bridging media citizen si citizens and uh, NGOs with the researchers to uh, engage and empower citizens and to influence policy and to help the researchers to gain better data and maybe to ask even more relevant research question, questions through dialogue with the citizens. Next, please. The mission of our Citizen Science Center is to bring citizens closer to science and scientists closer to society to broker knowledge sharing about citizen science and to open the research process for citizens across all levels of education and social groups through communication, education and learning. And to enable researchers to conduct excellent research with regards to citizen science and provide relevant services for researchers and uh, enable them to act themselves, of course, and to support the sustainable development goals. Next, please. Let me elaborate a little on citizen science and the SDGs. SDU committed to the SDGs two and a half years ago, and it is described by a strong group of citizen science researchers that citizen science can support the work on the SDGs. So our center supports and help to consolidate the SDU st uh, strategy of creating value for and together with society by working with the SDGs. At the time being, we have three ongoing citizen science SDG project and a new one coming up next year. The new pro project um, uh, aims to support people's health in connection to high blood pressure and training. And uh, our goal is to engage uh, 20,000 citizens in the research project and, uh, and, reach, and reach half a million people. Again, the collaboration with local TV broadcasters is key to secure recruitment and engagement at uh, this scale. Next, please. The task in the center is to initiate citizen science project and dissolve the traditional wall between researchers, teachers, and other links in the chain of education to initiate project in collaboration with the public, including new and established media, and to support researchers in managing citizen science project and building community. And of course, to promote uh, open science, including, for example, fair data. 
the citizen science center will also play a role as an enhancer of research knowledge knowledge and discussion in society including uh, public debate in the media and amongst the decision makers next please so what exactly do we do uh, as you can see from the keywords it's quite uh, hands-on and it includes a lot of talking with colleagues with researchers external partners about opportunities and goals and how to plan and execute a citizen science project as well as teaching citizen science next why the library we are often asked why the center is based in the library and uh, here are some of the reasons why we chose the library our faculty sees the library as a neutral ground at the university and the library has already a central function in the open science it is a well-known bridge between public and research and between citizens and researchers the library have uh, resources with professional competence and skills useful for citizen science such as uh, dissemination, public communication and in engagement, setting up workshop and facilitating a dialogue, partnership with the external non-academic partners, engaging public schools and high schools and so forth. And library, our library has uh, a strong network also uh, with the public libraries. So at SDU, the library is absolutely the best place for a citizen science center supporting all of our factors. Next. The future. Well, the center is still at an early stage and we need to consolidate the center as a local hub for citizen science. We need to secure funding for the center and evolve some of our citizen science project uh, going towards a higher level of uh, co-creation, co uh, find exciting new ways of doing citizen science and measuring the social impact from citizen science project and build strong collaborations with citizen science colleagues all over the world. Next. Well, in the last uh, five years, we have supported uh, well, at least 22 citizen science projects with a total reach of uh, 1 million people. And uh, our best advice to get started on citizen science is just do it. Team up with strong professors, secure support from the top leaders and jump in. It's good fun, as you can see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's look at the chat. Does anybody have questions for Anna Katrin? And my uh, good colleague uh, Thomas Kastet is uh, also present if uh, and he will also be uh, available for questions, I think. Uh, uh, Sueli, you have a question, please unmute yourself. Go ahead. We cannot hear you, you're muted. Sorry, yeah. yes, I, I absolutely love this presentation. Um, it, very, very inspiring and I would like to have this at Marseille University, exactly the same. Um, my question is, how do you get researchers to, to participate? Because uh, they have their own research, pro this takes time, you know, this takes a lot of personal commitment, personal motivation, you know, everything has to follow and it has to be somehow rewarded, recognized, uh, facilitated. How, how do you deal with that part of getting researchers to, to, to give in, uh, you know, even more than they are asked actually? Yeah, well, we have done this, uh, this uh, workshop uh, at the Citizen Science Center. And I think that our researchers find that it is exciting and citizen science is, an, is an, a possibility for, for gaining better data, but also uh, have discussions and dialogues with, uh, with citizens. So I feel that um, 
they believe that they can get some something good out of this uh, work. And Thomas and, and I promise to support their citizens pro uh, science projects uh, as good as we can. So it is a collaboration between the researchers doing citizen science project and, uh, and the citizen science center where we support them. And of course they do their, their research. So I think it's I think it's possible, but it needs a, a lot of talking. I think Francesca has her uh, a hand up as well. Please unmute yourself. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the two examples. They are very, very uh, encouraging uh, for people who are interested in citizen science and uh, are, are looking for good examples. I have one question for Paul and one for Anne Catherine. The question for Paul is uh, um, the, uh, concerning the collaboration of citizens. If there are some groups that are more interested in collaborating and how you uh, reach some uh, subgroups of population or citizens that maybe they're not so much interested, but they will be very interesting to collaborate with. I'm talking, for example, collaborating with people with an ethic ethnic background can be very useful in some areas of research, but it might be difficult to engage them because they have more concern for privacy, they might have cultural uh, um, uh, orientation, or also maybe they have less time uh, because they're younger and they're not yet retired. This is the question for Paul. The question for Anne, uh, Catherine, for Anne, uh, Catherine concerns uh, the involvement again of citizens in uh, citizen science project, and in particular in the area of health, uh, raises some questions concerning privacy, collection of data, and these aspects. So when you are a researcher, you have a specific requirements. You have some guidelines that the university of the research group gives you. When you are a citizen, you still have, I mean, as a citizen, you have to obey the laws, but anyway, you have maybe less requirements or you would need more um, training to collaborate with science. How are you going or have you, how have you already solved these aspects? Thank you very much. I will be waiting for your answers. Thank you. Okay, Francesca, well, let me start by trying to answer a question you put to me. Uh, and I think the answer is in, in two parts. We are, uh, UCL is in the middle of a, a large metropolitan uh, city. Uh, and um, we work very closely with the London boroughs uh, to reach out to uh, uh, lay citizens uh, who are interested in uh, working with us. So um, UCL is in the London borough of uh, Camden. And one of our academic uh, institutes, Institute for Global Prosperity, does work with Camden and works very closely with uh, the, the borough of, of, of Camden in citizen science uh, activity. Uh, and what we're trying to do uh, with uh, Camden is to create down the line, a joint citizen science centre, rather like the one that uh, Anne Catherine has been describing, but a collaboration between the London Borough, in which the university sits, and the university itself. And that would be similar to the um, citizen science centre in, in Barcelona, in, uh, in Catalonia, which is a collaboration between the city, funded by the city actually, uh, a collaboration between the city uh, 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 and the university. So that's one way in which we uh, get um, uh, interest from lay citizens. Uh, the second is uh, a, a similar um, activity. We are building a new campus in UCL. Um, we are in the middle of a city where there is nowhere to expand to. So we are now building a new campus on the 2012 Olympic site at Stratford in East London. And it's called UCL East because it's in the east of London. Uh, and there are large um, percentages 
of um, non-English um, speakers living in, in the boroughs in uh, East London. And UCL is deliberately targeting UCL East on our new campus as a showcase for public engagement and for citizen science. So one of the things we will be doing on the new site once our new buildings are finished, which should happen next year in 2022, we'll be creating a social archive uh, for the Bangladeshi community, which is very strong in uh, Stratford, where the UCL East um, development is, uh, and working alongside them to collect their memories of, of living in London, their experiences of living in London, uh, and to collect photographs, um, video recordings, um, oral uh, recordings of their testimony. Uh, and for them to dictate to us what the shape of the outcome will, will be in terms of understanding what their experiences are, being, uh, and um, they're not, not having English as your first language, but living in, in a global city like, uh, uh, like London. So um, UCL East is going to be a particular pitch where we reach out to the uh, non-traditional uh, communities in order to bring citizen science to bear, in order to integrate ourselves better with a local uh, society. So I hand over to anne Catherine for her answer now. Okay, well, Francesca, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question because privacy, health issue, and uh, clinical, clinical research, there is a, a problem in, inside this uh, area. And uh, we are extremely careful about what we do. And uh, we talk about it every time. And we talk to the, the legal officers at the university, how can we do it? And at the time being, we have had projects which we had uh, turned down because we couldn't get around it. But, um, but it's also possible in some ways to, to find solution where, where we can secure this, uh, this uh, privacy and still get along with the, with the health project. I can see that my colleague Thomas has uh, raised a hand. I don't know if he, he wants to elaborate on this. A little bit, uh, just as a case in our latest project, I think I spent as my, I was the, we, we normally or arrange our projects. So we have a principal investigator, which is a researcher and a project manager, which is one from the citizen science uh, office. Uh, it could be an Katrina, me or other colleagues. And in our latest project, I spent just as much time on GDPR and privacy issues as the whole other project management together. And it is an increasing issue and problem really. And I think uh, the latest project that anne Katrina mentioned, Going With The Heart, which is potentially a very big project, uh, all these issues start 15 months in advance for negotiation. So, so it's to say that privacy is uh, of course critical, but it's also to say that these are not things, citizen science knowledge centers or libraries or even researchers can, can sort out on their own. We need professional legal help in order to investigate and navigate this so we don't get burned down the line or there are issues with the, with the research as it comes out. So it is really an important uh, uh, objective. And just a brief comment to Paul. Um, this uh, fall, we have been doing a history project a little bit in reminiscence of what you're saying. Um, we have a history professor who together, he is empowering high school students to go out and interview elderly people on their life experiences. So it's absolutely possible to do exactly what you envision. And I think there are tools also being built, for example, at SDU, that, that can aid these uh, methods and also to crucially develop them together with the community that we are serving. So, so there are some quite good examples of what you are uh, relaying already. Thank you very much, Thomas, uh, and, and Catherine and Paul. We have about one minute left, so I don't think we have enough time uh, to answer all questions. 
But I wanted to thank uh, the presenters and the participants for this active engagement. We hope to deliver a bit more of this uh, uh, next year as well. So just stay tuned. Uh, there's more content coming out of the Citizen Science Working Group. Uh, if you uh, visit our website, there's always going to be something to um, find there. And on this note, I think I would like to say uh, thank you once again and uh, uh, goodbye.